Hello and welcome to this video lecture in the course for Secure Systems Engineering. In this video lecture, uh, we will talk about uh, something known as power analysis attacks. Uh, so the essential idea over here is that uh, when a device is actually computing uh, something on uh, based on a, some secret information, uh, what the attacker would do is that uh, the attacker would tap the power lines of that device and monitor the cons power consumed uh, by that device. Using this power consumption, the attacker then would be able to identify the secret information that uh, is being processed by that system. So we will uh, start off this video lecture with uh, why this is such a problem and uh, uh, we would see a, a few techniques about how such a problem can be handled and uh, finally we look at uh, some countermeasures for power analysis attacks. Just start out with uh, some basic fundamentals about CMOS technology. Now every digital device that is being used uh, today works uh, on CMOS uh, technology. At least uh, CMOS is a complementary metal oxide semiconductor technology and uh, I would not say every but I think most of the electronic devices uh, work with the CMOS technology. CMOS would actually be used to actually build uh, fundamental gates like for instance this gate over here uses a PMOS and an NMOS uh, transistor coupled together to form an inverter. So we will see a little more uh, detail about what a CMOS inverter looks like. So let us look a little more in detail about a CMOS inverter. So uh, this uh, is the CMOS inverter, it comprises of two transistors T1 uh, and T2 and uh, a load capacitor C. So when the input uh, is uh, at 0, the transistor T1 is on and uh, transistor T2 uh, is off and as a result uh, the capacitor gets charged through this VDD. Thus we have uh, the output which is 1. On the other hand when we have an input which is set to 1, the, the uh, transistor T2 turns on while a transistor T1 would turn off. As a result, uh, this capacitor would then discharge uh, through uh, this transistor T2 leading to a uh, output which is 0. So as we see uh, from this uh, particular figure, when there is a transition in input from 0 to 1, the output uh, uh, changes from 1 to 0 due to the uh, charging and the discharging of uh, the capacitor. Now if we actually look at the power consumed by the CMOS inverter, it would look something like this. So power is consumed every time the capacitor CL either charges or discharges. In other words, every time there is a tran transition in the output from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, there is some power consumed by the device. So for example, over here we look at the uh, output of the inverter and what we see is uh, that uh, during this transition from 0 to 1 in this particular case, there is some power that gets consumed. Now uh, if we are able to tap into the power lines of the device, we would be able to actually monitor uh, the power consumed by the device using an oscilloscope. So the oscilloscope will give us the dynamic uh, power consumption of uh, th the device. Now most electronic circuits are actually synchronous digital circuits. These circuits have a clock uh, as input and uh, most of the activity goes on when the clock transitions. So for example over here we have uh, a clock which is sent to a particular device and uh, we have actually showing two inputs data 0 and data 1. So what we see is that uh, every time uh, the clock transitions it is likely that uh, the data 0 and data 1 may transition. So in this particular case uh, we are considering the positive edge of the clock and we see that uh, only on this positive edge uh, it is likely that the data actually transitions. So therefore when we actually look at the power consumed by this device we would see that uh, the power would be the a function of uh, the type of transitions that happen. So for example over here we have uh, data 0 and data 1 and uh, both of them transition from 0 to 1 in this particular clock pulse and as we have seen in the previous uh, slides during this transition there is a uh, power that is consumed to charge and uh, discharge uh, the capacitor and therefore the total power consumed by the device 
uh, is the sum of uh, both these transitions. So, we see a high peak in power consumed uh, over here due to the charging of the capacitor in each of these cases. Now, uh, in this particular clock pulse, when there is a transition from 0 to 1 in this particular clock pulse, what we see is that there is no change in data 0, but data 1 transitions from 1 to 0. And uh, as a result, uh, if we connect this to the uh, transistors, what we have seen in the previous slide, the capacitor would be discharged and uh, the power consumed would be actually negative because of the discharging of the capacitor. Similarly, in this particular transition, we have data uh, 0 which is moving from uh, 0 to 1 and therefore, uh, the discharging of the capacitor shows up in the power consumption. Now, over here uh, again we have data 1 uh, moving from 0 to 1 and the power is used to actually charge the capacitor. So, what we notice over here is that first the charging and the discharging of the capacitors uh, which are present in the various gates present within the device uh, shows up in the power consumed. Uh, secondly, what we also see is that the amount of power consumed depends on uh, the number of gates. Uh, that amount of power consumed depends on the number of gates that is actually making the transition. For instance, over here we have uh, uh, two gates making the 0 to 1 transition and therefore, the power consumed is quite high because uh, we have both the capacitors cha getting charged. While uh, in this particular clock pulse, we have just one of these uh, lines going from 0 to 1 and therefore, the power consumed is co uh, comparatively lesser. Now, the essence of power consumption attacks is the following. Uh, an attacker assuming that he has a device in his possession uh, would not be able to look at individual transitions of every line uh, or every signal that is present within the device. And therefore, for him all of these intermediate transitions uh, which we have seen in the previous slide is completely blacked out. What the attacker would have is a possibly a source for the clock, he would definitely be able to monitor the power consumed by the device. This is possible because every device requires an external battery or power source for it to function. So, what the attacker could do is that he could actually connect an oscilloscope uh, and tap out the power consumed by the device and therefore, as the uh, device is uh, executing the attacker would be able to monitor uh, the amount of power consumed by that device. The clock uh, is an optional feature, uh, it may or may not be possible for an attacker to always monitor the clock source uh, for a device. Every device would possibly have an external uh, crystal oscillator which generates a clock and uh, once, this, uh, once this, this clock enters into the device, there may be some operations uh, on that particular clock source which uh, multiply or divide uh, that particular clock frequencies. So, thus uh, the clock source may not always be visible uh, to an attacker, but definitely every device since it would require an external power source, therefore an attacker would be able to monitor dynamically the power consumed by that device. The essential idea about a power analysis attack is for the attacker to monitor uh, the power consumed by the device and then be able to predict uh, some internal secrets which are present uh, in the device. Needless to say, uh, what is required is that the, attack, uh, that the device is actually operating on uh, that particular secret. For example, a very popular application of uh, power analysis attacks is on cryptographic ciphers. And uh, the assumption is that we have uh, the attacker has in his possession a device uh, which is doing cryptographic operations. Uh, the uh, key which is kept secret is stored within the device. Now, every time an encryption or a decryption gets triggered, uh, this key is read from the internal storage and used to actually do the corresponding encryption or the decryption. The objective of the attacker is to monitor the power consumed. Uh, by this device during the encryption or decryption process and uh, then uh, try to identify what the secret key stored within the device is. So, most of these power analysis attacks make the assumption that the attacker can actually manipulate or uh, monitor the input messages that get uh, encrypted or 
the uh, output of that device. For example, uh, the encrypted messages are visible to the attacker. Thus, uh, the major assumptions uh, for a power analysis attack are the following. First, the attacker has the device that he wants to actually attack. So, the attacker can actually power on this device. He can uh, monitor the various inputs uh, and or the outputs from that device and uh, three, he is able to tap into the power lines and during the process of encryption and decryption, the attacker should be able to monitor the amount of power consumed by that device using an oscilloscope. So, uh, there are various types of power analysis attacks uh, ranging from a uh, very simple or the simple power analysis uh, to differential power analysis which is far more difficult and also far more difficult to protect. Uh, and finally, the template based uh, attacks which is the most powerful form of uh, power analysis attacks. Now, in the simple uh, power analysis, uh, it may not be always applicable to every uh, type of cryptographic cipher or every application that is running uh, on the device, but essentially makes use of uh, certain attributes of the particular program. So, let us look at uh, simple power analysis. So, uh, let us say we have uh, a device which is performing the following operation. The operation is called uh, square and multiply. Uh, it is a very common operation that is used uh, for cryptographic ciphers like the RSA. So, what happens over here is that uh, this particular algorithm which we assume is implemented in a device uh, takes three parameters x, uh, c and n. Typically, the c is going to be secret and it is what the attacker wants to obtain. So, the algorithm uh, what it does is that it first initializes z uh, to a value of 1 and then it has a loop uh, i ranging from l minus 1 down to 0, where l is the length of c that is the number of bits present in c. l minus 1 corresponds to the most significant bit of uh, c, while c 0 corresponds to the least significant bit or the LSB. So, in each iteration of this loop, we see that there are two operations that are performed. First is a squaring on z, where we have uh, z squared modular n that is performed. And uh, if uh, c i is equal to 1, that is if the ith bit in c in this particular iteration is set to 1, then we also have a multiplication. And uh, this goes on for every bit present in c. Now, consider that uh, we have uh, our device which is actually implementing uh, this particular algorithm is in the hands of the attacker. The attacker let us assume has uh, knowledge of uh, x and n, although in this particular case it is not very important, but what is important is that the attacker is able to power on the device, he is able to force uh, this algorithm to execute and uh, he is able to monitor the power consumed by that particular device. So, what we see is that depending on the value of uh, c i that is the ith bit in c, the power would actually vary. If for instance, the value of c i uh, equal to 0, then uh, only this particular square operation is performed. Uh, on the other hand, if we have a value of uh, c i to be equal to 1, then the square operation is followed by the multiplication operation. This difference between a value of c i, whether the value of c i is 0 or 1 shows up in the power consumed by that device. So, this is something how of what the power actually looks like and what we clearly see from here is that certain regions have a distinctively different uh, power profile compared to other regions. So, uh, if a uh, attacker actually uh, monitors this power consumed over time uh, like this particular figure shown here, then attacker would simply be able to look at uh, this power profile and uh, be able to deduce what the secret values of uh, c i are. So, for in this way the attacker could simply uh, be able to obtain every bit of uh, the secret c. So, for example, over here he identifies that uh, there is only a square operation that is performed and therefore, the value of c should be 0. On the other hand, uh, he sees that 
this region is a characteristic when 1 is obtained and therefore, he would be able to deduce that uh, this bit is 1 and so on. So, in this way just by monitoring the power consumed uh, the uh, attacker would be able to read out uh, the secret key through the power consumed by the device. Now, this is uh, obviously the a very simple attack uh, and uh, over the years people have uh, developed much more stronger ways to implement exactly uh, this algorithm and thus uh, simple power attacks like the one we uh, discussed uh, are not very applicable in modern day devices. The reason being is that uh, most modern day cryptographic devices would not be using such algorithms where uh, the leakage through the power is quite obvious. So, uh, a much more powerful attack is known as a differential power analysis attack. So, the main concept over here unlike uh, the simple power analysis attack is to collect a large number of power traces and then perform some kind of statistical analysis on these power traces from which we deduce the key. So, the basic idea of differential power analysis attacks or DPA as it is uh, uh, commonly known as uh, is that we have a particular device over here and the uh, assumption is the attacker has this device and this device has a key which is present inside. So, this secret key is what the attacker is uh, interested to actually retrieve. So, what the attacker does is firstly he builds a model of the device. The assumption here is that the attacker knows exactly what operations are going on within this device and the only thing that the attacker does not know is the secret key. The whole attack therefore, is to be able to retrieve the secret key of this device. Now, the attack goes as follows. First, the attacker creates a model of this particular device and then also guesses the key and then he generates various input uh, data and feeds the same input data to the device which is under test uh, as well as to the model of uh, that device. So, to the device under test once uh, he feeds the input data and forces that device to start uh, computing on that input data, he measures the power consumed through an oscilloscope. Uh, side by side he uses the device model to obtain what is known as a hypothetical power consumption of that device. So, note that uh, this power consumption is obtained from the from an oscilloscope and it is the real power consumption when uh, the actual secret key. Uh, is being computed upon. So, this power consumption is obtained by measuring instruments such as a digital oscilloscope while on the other hand uh, the power obtained from the model of the device is obtained uh, just by some calculations or just by some mathematical uh, analysis. So, note that this uh, power model is uh, with a guessed key this is with a key that the attacker actually guesses. So, now what he does he has these two uh, power consumption the actual power consumption with the real key and uh, the hypothetical power consumption with the guess key. So, he uh, performs a statistical analysis between these two and then uh, compares uh, the results. So, if the guess key is indeed correct this statistical comparison would be able to identify if the guess key is indeed correct or uh, the key is wrong. So, we will look at more in details about uh, how this uh, differential power analysis attack actually works. So, we will take a very small uh, circuit uh, to explain this particular scenario. The circuit that we will actually look at it looks something like this way. So, what we see over here is that we have a register R and some function f. Now, the output of this particular function is fed back to a multiplexer and then gets latched into this register the input uh, to this particular circuit is P. To understand how differential power analysis attacks actually work we will take a very small circuit as shown over here. So, this small circuit uh, it takes as an input P and it takes a secret K and then operates on the secret uh, in an iterative manner. For example, in the first clock pulse uh, the input P is taken and it gets latched into this register in the next uh, clock pulse this value of p is fed into f. Uh, f you could think of as any kind of nonlinear function. So, what f does is that it operates on the value of p and also the secret key k. Now, the output of f is fed back 
uh, through this multiplexer and gets uh, uh, latched in this register. On subsequent clock cycles, uh, this register is then fed uh, to F and there is an operation uh, on F uh, based on this register contents and the key and uh, the results are fed back and stored to the register. Thus, what we see is that uh, this circuit would operate on uh, in an iterative manner. The first iteration would be based on P while all subsequent iterations are based on uh, the result of the previous iteration. So, uh, the output of F is C. We assume that the attacker does not know the value of C and is trying to obtain the value of K. So, as we discussed the first step uh, in a differential power analysis attack is to create a model of the device. So, uh, there are two uh, common ways it by which this uh, uh, hypothetical power consumption model uh, can be actually uh, created and uh, this is known as the Hamming distance model and the Hamming weight model respectively. So, in the Hamming weight model, uh, the model essentially uh, looks at this register R and counts the number of ones that are present in this register R. So, for example, let us say that the initial value of uh, uh, present in the register R is 1011. In the next transition, that is in the next uh, clock uh, uh, pulse, we assume that the next value of R is 1101. In this case, what we do is we simply count the number of ones that are present. In this case, there are three ones present and we say that the hypothetical power consumed by the model is 3 in this particular clock pulse. In the next clock pulse, uh, let us if we assume that R has a value of 1001, uh, then the hypothetical power consumed is 2 uh, and so on. So, this is the Hamming weight model. So, uh, note that this is a hypothetical power consumed. So, the uh, attacker is not actually finding out what the contents of the register is, but he is just actually predicting what the uh, contents of the register may be. The other uh, model that is quite often followed in these kind of attacks is known as the Hamming distance model. So, here we actually look at the uh, number of bits that toggle from one clock pulse to another. So, again we are looking at this register R and uh, between two consecutive clock pulses, uh, we look at the uh, number of bits that actually change. So, for example, over here let us say that the initial value of R is uh, 1011 and in the next clock pulse the register changes to the value of 1101. Thus, we see that there are uh, two bits that get toggled essentially this, uh, uh, this bit 0 has changed to 1 and uh, this bit which is 1 has changed to 0 and we compute the Hamming distance to be 2. Similarly, if we consider these two consecutive clock uh, pulses and let us say that uh, the register R has changed to a value of 1001, uh, we note that here uh, there is only one bit that has been changed and therefore, the Hamming distance is 1. So, in this way you see as this particular device is operating on uh, in this iterative manner, we get a sequence of uh, hypothetical powers uh, that are uh, consumed. Uh, this hypothetical power in the Hamming distance model would be 2, 1, 3, 1 and so on. Uh, in the Hamming weight model, this hypothetical power would be 3, 2, 1, 3 and so on. So, now let us look at the differential power analysis attack. So, what we are interested in is the first iteration that occurs. Note that we had mentioned that in the first iteration, we have P which is sent as an input which gets uh, uh, stored in the register and then uh, this gets operated on by uh, this function f. So, note that we also mentioned that this function f uh, takes as input the key and provides some intermediate output which the attacker is uh, not able to uh, see. So, uh, to simplify this entire figure, we just showed the input f uh, and the secret key and the f operation and the corresponding intermediate value c. So, uh, what the attacker could do is that uh, he could create a guess of the secret key. So, in this case, we are assuming that uh, P and K are of 4 bits and uh, also C is of 4 bits and uh, the attacker has actually guessed uh, that the key value is 1010. So, now uh, what we are also assuming is that uh, the attacker is able to choose or select plain text and send to this device and therefore, he knows the value of plain text. 
side by side as this f function is being operated upon uh, the uh, attacker is able to monitor the power consumed by the device. So, an important assumption we make over here is that the attacker knows the functionality of f, but uh, does not know uh, k nor c, but since has guessed the value of k, he can also compute c based on that guess. So, this would be in essentially a guessed value of c. Since he knows the uh, plain text p and uh, he has guessed c, he can al also compute uh, the corresponding c value. So, the attack goes like this the attacker chooses a particular value of p and sends it to the device and while the device is uh, computing on this p and k value, uh, the uh, attacker has monitored the power consumed. So, corresponding to the p value, he gets a power trace which looks something like this. Now, side by side he also makes a key guess, in this case it is 1111 and then based on the value of p and the key guess, he computes uh, what the intermediate value c would be and uh, in the Hamming weight model, he then creates the hypothetical power consumed by the device. So, uh, we take that the hypothetical power is the number of uh, ones present in c. So, since we are following the Hamming weight model. So, we see here that there are 4 ones. So, the hypothetical power in this case is 4. Now, he repeats this for several uh, more uh, iterations. In each iteration, he selects a p a value feeds it to the device, gets a corresponding uh, actual power consumed by the device and then for that guest key which in this case is 1111 compute C and uh, obtains the hypothetical power consumed uh, based on the Hamming weight in this particular case. The next step is to compute a correlation between the actual power consumed that is this part and the hypothetical power. So, uh, note that corresponding to each row in this that is corresponding to each input p, uh, he would get one hypothetical power and one real power uh, consumed. So, note that this is uh, over time while this is just a constant value. So, what the attacker does is that for each point uh, in this real power consumption, he, he correlates this with a hypothetical power. For example, he would compute the Pearson's correlation coefficient and uh, uh, therefore, he would get a coefficient score. Thus, what he would obtain is a sequence of correlation values corresponding to each point uh, in this waveform. So, this particular red line over here shows one particular correlation that has been done between these three points and uh, this hypothetical power consumption. Among the sequence of correlation values that he obtains, he only considers that which has the maximum correlation. So, he considers only that particular point for example, say this point which has the maximum uh, correlation. So, note that uh, this hypothetical power consumed was based on a, a key guess. In this case, if you look back, we had guessed the key as 1111. Of course, uh, the attacker does not know what the uh, actual key is. So, he iterates through every possible value of k. So, he would get something like this for every possible value of k, he would be able to create a table like this corresponding to the same p value, a guest k value, the real power consumed and the hypothetical power consumed. Since we are considering a 4 bit key, so there would be uh, 16 such tables which, which would be obtained. For each of these key guesses, he would uh, compute the correlation coefficient and therefore, he would be able to get 16 different uh, correlation coefficients. Uh, he would then choose the one correlation coefficient which is the maximum. This graph for example, uh, which is uh, obtained from this particular website shows how the maximum correlation coefficient varies with different values of key. So, uh, in this particular example, they had used uh, the AES block cipher uh, as the uh, device which is uh, being attacked and each part of the AES key is just of uh, one byte and therefore, has 256 different possibilities. So, uh, the y axis on the other hand uh, has the correlation which is computed for each key guess. So, what we see is that uh, for wrong key guesses, we have a correlation which is uh, quite small which is uh, less than 0 0.02. On the other hand, uh, if the uh, guess is correct which in this case is uh, the key is 0 x 73, we get a high peak in the correlation value. This high peak would thus permit the attacker to identify the correct key. Now, uh, what actually is affected by this uh, particular attack is the number of iterations uh, that are done for each case. 
know that uh, we had taken this table and each line in this or each row in this particular table uh, corresponds to one uh, power measurement that is made uh, in the device uh, and uh, one point uh, in the hypothetical power that was computed. So, the larger number of such rows present the more accurately the key can be recovered correctly. So, this particular graph shows the number of measurements required relating to the previous table. Uh, the number of measurements implies the number of uh, rows in the tables and what we see is that as the uh, number of measurements uh, keeps increasing and uh, goes towards uh, 10,000 in this case, the accuracy of identifying the secret key is increased. So, for example, if we have uh, very less uh, let us say around 100 uh, or so uh, measurements, we have a correlation which is less than 0 0.05, but as we increase the number of measurements, uh, we have a correlation which is quite high of uh, 0 0.1. So, speaking in another words, what we actually see is that as the number of uh, power measurements increases, this peak becomes more and more prominent. So, what we considered uh, in this example was that uh, the attacker used the Pearson's correlation coefficient between a hypothetical power consumed and the actual power consumed in order to identify uh, the correct secret key. Uh, so, there are uh, various other statistical techniques which have been evaluated. One of the most common things is uh, known as the mutual information, which essentially quantifies the uh, mutual dependence between the hypothetical power consumed and the real uh, power consumed. So, uh, this is given by this uh, particular equation. So, we will not go more into details about this. So, what we had looked in this previous example was that the attacker uses a Pearson's correlation coefficient or uh, something equivalent uh, in order to compute uh, the correlation between a hypothetical power consumption based on a guest key and uh, the actual power consumption measured from the device. A high value of correlation implies that uh, the attacker has guessed the key correctly. So, there are various other statistical uh, tools that can be used other than a correlation. Quite often uh, this mutual information is used which essentially quantifies the dependence between the hypothetical power and the real power consumption. Other techniques used are uh, the Bayes analysis which computes the probability of the hypothesis given uh, the leakage. Uh, one of the most earliest forms of uh, statistical comparison is uh, known as the difference of means. So, we will look uh, more in detail about how this difference of means actually works. What we look at again is this particular computation where uh, there is the p which is taken as input and computed upon uh, with this function f and there is also the key which is kept secret. Now, uh, what the attacker does is that he guesses the key and based on that guessed key and the known value of p, he computes c. So, c is of course, the key guess and therefore, based on the guessed key, he can obtain this c guess which in this case is 1111, 1110 and 1101. Note that uh, this c guess keeping k constant only depends on the value of p. So, what he would next do is that he would uh, consider one single bit in this c guess. So, for example, let us say that he is considering the least significant bit uh, of the c guess and then what he would do uh, is that depending on the value of this least significant bit of c guess, he would distribute uh, these uh, power actual power consu consumed into two buckets. The first bucket corresponds to the c guess being 0 while the next bucket corresponds to the c guess equal to 1. So, for example, over here the uh, least significant bit is 1 and therefore, he would move this power measurement into the bucket 1. In this particular case, we have the least significant bit uh, to be 0 in C guess and therefore, he moves uh, this to the uh, bucket 0. So, in the same way, uh, in this case, he has uh, the least significant bit of C guess to be 1 and therefore, this should be moved to bucket 1. So, eventually after doing this over large number of different power measurements, he computes the average of bucket 0 and the average of bucket 1. So, this is the known as the difference of means for that corresponding key guess. So, what is observed is that if the key guess happens to be correct, then uh, this particular difference, the differences between the average of these two buckets would be maximized and this maximum uh, difference of means can be then used to identify what the secret key is.
So uh, differential power attacks have been known for almost two decades now and uh, there have been several countermeasures that have been uh, developed over these years. So these countermeasures have been applied uh, at three different levels. Uh, they can be applied at the hardware level, at the implementation level or at the algorithm level. At the hardware level what people have suggested uh, is that uh, the standard CMOS logic uh, be replaced with the uh, other logic which are resistant uh, to these power analysis attacks. So these uh, techniques for example, the WDDL uh, gates would uh, are built in such a way so that uh, the power consumed is independent of the uh, computations that are performed by the corresponding gates. Uh, at the implementation level techniques such as masking and threshold implementations have been used where randomization has been incorporated into the design so that where the randomness limits the amount of information that the attacker can gain from the power consumed by the device. A third method uh, is at the algorithmic level where uh, researchers have actually been able to build, build uh, algorithms in particular cipher algorithms as well as protocols which can prevent power analysis attacks. Uh, these algorithms inherently are built so that uh, the leakage would not give enough of information to an attacker. Uh, to glean secret information like the secret key. Two of the popular algorithms in this case is known as DRECON uh, which is stands for DPA resistance by construction and the reeking techniques. Thank you.